but I think we all know these. And yet the name Yeshu is, is an interesting um, nickname is, is improper. But uh, this uh, negative impersonation of, of this Yeshu is not known in the first century. So the fact that, that the rabbis who were declaring that they were able to win debates with the Almighty and therefore they were gods in their own right and and that the Almighty had to study the Talmud is this is blasphemous gibberish. So the first century, the ancient ossuaries or, or, or uh, stone bone boxes where the the remains of people were were being more and more uncovered and, and um, what they found was that one of the bone boxes identified the person buried as Yeshua, the son of Joseph. On the side of the same box, his name appears a second time as Yeshu. So they must be talking about the same Yeshu, and Yeshua, the son of Joseph. Now, while these, these bone boxes have nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth, right, which we know he didn't die, and we, they don't have his bones anywhere, he died, but he, he was resurrected physically three days and three nights later. What this does is prove that the, the name Yeshu was simply a sort and form Yeshua, known in the first century not as a curse, but uh, similar to a nickname. Now, the, the Greek name Jesus and the English Jesus both come from the shortened form of the Hebrew name Yeshu, not directly from the original form of Yeshua or Yehoshua. So that's, you know, that's quite a, it's fairly simple. It's good to have this as an understanding. So when, you know, you're challenged or people are, th are throwing things, uh, verbal things at you, you know, you, at least you have an understanding that the first century ossuaries carried the name Yeshua as well as Yeshua. So the fact that Yeshua is used throughout uh, Hebrew Matthew uh, in, in um, a di slightly different context, that there's nothing wrong with it. Just stick with this uh, nickname. You know, we have the same thing with the, with the different yod hey vav hey abbreviations, and, and um, sometimes uh, the, you know the Jews of the Middle Ages and at that time used the used different acronyms and names to point out how it should be put into uh, Hebrew. So. Um, an interesting point on this comes from the divine name appears a second time in Greek Matthew 1.24, which uh, we all understand readily, uh, the phrase, the angel of the Lord. So here we have this term, the Lord, uh, in English, has come from Greek and Aramaic, but actually resides in Hebrew Matthew 1.24. Uh, Hebrew Matthew has the angel of this H with these double apostrophes which means they would they would put this H with an, with double apostrophes where yod hey vav hey was in scripture or in Hebrew so that you would understand they not us they're trying to make us not understand but they understood that this is actually the angel of Jehovah so, you know, so here you have now this Hebrew Matthew is giving us a lot that the, that the Pharisees don't sit in the seat of Moses, that Moses does. And you're to obey what Moses said, not what the Pharisees in their blasphemies produce. You know, so here you have it. Hebrew Matthew, the angel of Jehovah. Another tradition Jewish scribes followed in Hebrew was to systematically change the divine epithet Elohim to Elohim. One different uh, consonant here. The rabbinic law forbids referring to God as Elohim, as well as Jehovah, except when reciting a prayer or reading scripture. So when you're reading, reciting a prayer or, and, and reading scripture, you're allowed to use the term Elohim. But in any other context, you have to use Elohim. So here, you know, so here you have this uh, modifications put in so that the uh, the Pharisaics as they, they were print mostly wiped out but those that resided and, and developed on into the you know on into the Middle Ages or what we're calling the Middle Ages with Maimonides and all the other uh, saints of the Most High as they're termed saint to them is defined as someone who has uh, 
extensive critical intelligence. So your, your sainthood is determined by a smart yard, not what you do with, the, with the, the covenant. So that's good. Only smart people can get into the world tomorrow is, is how, it's, how it's worded. So the, you know, there's another interesting scribal feature throughout the Hebrew Matthew. And um, if any of you didn't put, pick this little booklet up, I've got, I still have a number left here so we can uh, get them to everybody because it's just a, a useful thing to have in your, you know, in, alongside of your uh, Bible where you can write some of the key points in the back of it to help with remembering. But it, it's important because uh, this, there's nothing wrong with using the term Yeshu from which we get the Jesus or Jesu and Jesus. Anglicized, because when they're they're making these modifications in other in other areas, you know, you come up with a term like Emmanuel. And here we are back in Hebrew, uh, Matthew one twenty three. Uh, the abbreviations are are a short form. It means to say. So th it means to say. So in other words. Yes, well, this is what it says, but here is what it means to say. So 123, the phrase of uh, Rotze Lamar introduces the explanation of the name Emmanuel. So the Hebrew reads, She shall call his name Emmanuel, which means to say, God is with us. So, but interesting, instead of the Hebrew, it means to say, Greek uh, Matthew 123 says, a being translated as. Now, he Hebrew Matthew did not need to translate the name Emmanuel, only to explain the significance of the Hebrew name in the context of Joseph's dream, which is the frame of reference for this. So here you go. If you don't have the context right, you won't have a clue what people are talking about. You have to have the context. We need to make sure, that's why we don't like quoting a few scriptures, few blocks. You may well have to read the chapter in front and the chapter to behind it to be sure you're understanding the frame of reference for the context. You know, that's quite a, these are very, very important uh, uh, proofs of this Hebrew Matthew, you know. This, uh, we, she will call his name Emmanuel, which means to say God is with us, which is a correct English rendering of the, of the Hebrew. And in the Greek, uh, it says being translated as. Well, you can see the point here. Well, being translated of what? Or from what? From what? So, um, see, the Hebrew did not need to translate the name Emmanuel. Explain the difference. I mean, it's quite a, an interesting thing. Names Miriam and Yeshua are marked with the, what's, the terminology for these apostasies and these um, emphasis are, are called Gershayim. In Hebrew, Matthew 1.21 and 1.25, the name Yeshua is also written slightly larger than the other words to give it extra emphasis. So here you have Matthew in the first century writing in Hebrew, making the name Yeshua slightly larger and Miriam slightly larger for the emphasis, which was allowed in that scribal tradition of, uh, of Messiah's time. So they would also mark numbers and other other features to it with these. Uh, I'm calling them apostrophe marks, but but these markings that all of the the scribes and, and the of the day would have understood. So um, you have this uh, remarkable book. It's worth everybody getting a copy of it if you don't have it from from. Uh, from uh, Howard, George Howard, and, uh, and of course we're, we're very appreciative of all the study and the work and principally the honesty that uh, Nehemia Gordon has given to all of us. He's a Karaite, which means a Bible only, or sola scriptura, Orthodox Jew, who uh, doesn't abide by the oral law or, or the, you know, the Mishnah and the the Gemara and all of the other 